Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this study. Uh, we're continuing our study of the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. Um, and uh, today we're going to look at uh, from the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, uh, the 23rd presentation that Jones did at that General Conference on the third angel's message. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the things that you teach us. And um, we're thankful for the Sabbath that's coming. We're thankful for the fellowship that we can have in knowing you and knowing uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, we pray, Lord, for each person who is studying truth. We know that you bring trials to us. We know our brother Dwight is facing a trial at the present time. We ask that you can be with him and um, that you can watch over his mom and his brother as well. We know, Lord, that there is um, things that we do not understand, but we do know. Lord, that you love us, that you are seeking our good, that you are drawing each of us through thy son uh, to you. We just pray, Lord, that as we study, that we'll have a closer walk with you. That we have a power and conviction in our lives to address the evils that exist in our own hearts and that we can reflect light to those around us who are in darkness. We ask for your presence here through thy spirit, and we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. You know, it's not quite Sabbath here yet. We still got it. Though it's coming quicker and quicker all the time, sun setting earlier and earlier. So um, we've been studying the three angels' message. The righteousness by that there's this idea that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith on its own, but we know that all three messages are righteousness by faith. That is, all of them are the everlasting gospel, and the everlasting gospel is the message of righteousness by faith. So it's not just the third angel's message. But the third angel's message is the time that we are in, since October 22, 1844. We're in the time of the third angel. We're in the time in which the Sunday law, the issues of the mark of the beast and the seal of God are manifest. And we know that in that history, in early Adventist history, they had gone through the first and second angel's messages. And then they began the third angel's message. And A.T. Jones uh, recognized that in 1892, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down, that is, the second angel had once again joined of the third angel. And Ellen White appears to have supported that idea, that they were in the time in which the Sunday law is imminent. And of course, that didn't occur. And, and that's because one is the third angel's message was rejected, but also the first and second angel's messages had been rejected and so um so that is the situation that existed in um in that history and it parallels our history so we now know the first and second angels messages are in process of being repeated the second angel joined the third angel at 9 11 and so that's for us the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. So, um, so this is is the the background in which we're studying these messages. Even though these messages are in the past, we're studying them as present truth for us today. That is, that history parallels ours, and so we are in this history. And the understanding of righteousness by faith has been clouded within Adventism. Uh, especially within that period um, that we would mark as the time of the end, 1989. So the first angel's message is going to be rejected by the church, and the second angel as well is being rejected. 
but God is still delivering those messages. They're repeated and they're going to be repeated again to the church. So we're in part of a movement that is understanding Millerite history and the repetition of Millerite history. Now, uh, in the last presentation, Jones was dealing with this, um, this might against right and the power of right against might. And if you go back to uh, the beginning, uh, even going back to the 18, I guess it was, I think it was the 1895 General Conference Bulletin, where he's going to talk about that. I can't remember if it was the 1893 or 1895. I'm forgetting. I think it might have been 1893. But he was talking about uh, doing, um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, petitions. And he's just saying, you know, that that it's too late, that our work is not to try to change things. These things have already uh, come into play. And, and basically saying that we can't look for the state to protect us. We need to look to Christ. And, and you can see how that fits in with what he's presented last time and what he's going to talk about here as well. Um, that our dependence is upon God. It's dependence upon the power of right. So, so just keep that in mind that this has really been his message. His message about the third angel's message is about a dependence upon God. But that includes also the first and second. So he says, I referred last night also uh, to a testimony on the thought as to this cont contest between the spiritual powers. I will read that at this point because it touches not only that, but this thing that we have studied right here as to our being absolutely dependent upon the power of right itself to win. We need not get stirred up nor be abusive nor anything of the kind, but just state the simple principle and let it stand trusting to itself to win. Now, this is a difficult thing, I think, for for us. Um, to understand is that we have to trust in God and not in ourselves. Okay, so I'm still having the same problem. I'm trying to fix this problem here. Sorry about that. <clears throat> that we trust that God is going to accomplish something that he promises in spite of what we see. That is... Um, when we look at uh, the things of this world, um, we see them, um, we see all these problems that are existing in this world. We, we would like to see them change. We're not happy with what's happening in this world. And uh, we have, we're being drawn in by Satan into the things of this world. Remember, we are ambassadors. We have nothing to do with this world. Our kingdom that we are a part of is Christ's kingdom, and it's not a part of this world. And so if we're drawn into this world, if we're drawn into that battle, uh, we, have, we don't have the power of right on our side. We're, we're using human power to solve that problem, and that's not going to solve the problem, right? So, um, so the power of, uh, let me see here. So the power of right, to trust in the power of right, takes faith. Now the power of might doesn't take faith. That is, when we're operating by might, we're operating by sight. Does that make sense? Can we see that? That when we're operating by might, we're operating by sight. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Yes. Okay. Because we're looking at a situation and we're trying to 
to fix it. We're, we're looking at what's immediately before us. But when we trust in the power of right, sight is not going to be a part of that. We don't look at what's happening to decide if right is winning. We have to trust by faith that right will win. Right? So we need not get stirred up, nor be abusive, nor anything of the kind, but just state the principle and let it stand, trusting to itself to win. That takes faith. In these times of special interest, the guardians of the flock of God should teach the people that the spiritual powers are in controversy. It is not human beings that are creating such intensity of feeling as now exists in the religious world. A power from Satan's spiritual synagogue is infused, infusing the religious elements of the world, arousing men to decided action to press the advantages Satan has gained by leading the religious world in determined warfare against those who make the word of God their guide and the sole foundation of doctrine. Satan's masterly efforts are now put forth to gather in every principle and every power that he can employ to controvert the binding claims of the law of Jehovah, especially the fourth commandment that defines who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, when we think about this, we know, of course, that the, Satan's main attack is upon the fourth commandment. But in doing that, he has attacked all of the commandments. He has created a world that doesn't even know God. Right. And, and we can look back to the 1840s with uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, you know, as, as Jones here is in, you know, in the end of the 1900s. But as you get into uh, the 20th century, um, even more undermining of Christianity is going to exist. And to a large degree from Christianity itself uh, through modern scholarship that destroys uh, the foundation of God's word. And then the deconstructionism of society uh, that's leading to the point that we are, you know, a hundred and some years later, um, where every evil is praised and every good is shouted down. So, so we live in, in a very difficult time and it's easy to get caught up in these events that are happening around us in the world, um, get drawn into this battle. But, you know, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. These are spiritual wickedness in high places. That is not so much the governments of this world. That's not who we're fighting, but it's, it's Satan and his evil angels and, and the lies that they are telling. So, so man is not our enemy. The man of sin has thought to change times and laws, but has he done it? That is the great issue. Rome and all the churches that have drunk up her cup of iniquity in thinking to change times and laws have exalted themselves above God and torn down God's great memorial, the seventh day Sabbath. The Sabbath was to stand representing God's power in his creation of the world in six um, six days and he's resting upon the seventh day wherefore he blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it because that in it he had rested from all his works which god created and made the object of the masterly working of the great deceiver has been to supersede god in his efforts to change times and laws he has been working to maintain a power in opposition to god and above him Here's the great issue. Um, just going to try something here. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, here is the great issue. Here are the two great powers confronting each other. The Prince of God, Jesus Christ, and the Prince of Darkness, Satan. Here comes the open conflict. There are but two classes in the world. And every human being will range under one of these two banners. The banner of the Prince of Darkness or the banner of Jesus Christ. Now, 
when we look at this idea of the two classes of worshipers, so this is a principle that goes right back to Genesis uh, chapter 3 um, and verse 15, dealing with the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the enmity that exists. So we have two classes. And, um, and in these two classes, uh, one is following God and one is not. Um, so um, we know that there, there's this enmity that exists between these two classes that is uh, hostility, especially the hostility that exists between those that are not following God and those that are following God. And we also know that God has uh, put an enmity against sin. Not so much an enmity against sinners. But when we see sin happening, uh, we don't like to see sin. Uh, but we need to focus upon the sin that's in ourselves. Obviously, there's an enmity towards sin that God gives when you're converted. But uh, not an enmity towards people. We're not in conflict with people. So we have these two great powers, the Prince of God. Jesus Christ and the Prince of Darkness, Satan. Here comes the open conflict. There are but two classes in the world, right? And every human being will range under one of these two banners, the banner of the Prince of Darkness or the banner of Jesus Christ. That's clear that if we're not with Christ, we're with uh, Satan. But to appeal to any kind of might in favor of the right is to step on which side of the contest? It is instantly to put ourselves on the side of might as against right. And that is the wrong side. And that puts us on the wrong side. Whatever our profession may be, it doesn't matter what we say. If we're using might as against right, we're on the wrong side. Now, of course, might can be seen in lots of different ways. We're not necessarily saying physical strength, but even just any of the sort of uh, ways in which Satan operates, a deceit, it would put us on the side of might as against right, right? Because we're not on the side of right if we're deceitful. You know, scheming, devising, manipulating situations, uh, vying for power and control, and when we do have authority or power given to us in some way by others. We use it in a way to shut down opposition. All of those things are the power of might as against right. So any way in which Satan operates, the way in which the church has operated against the 2520 um, and people who believe the 2520, if we do the same types of things against people that we disagree with, we're on the same side as those who um, oppose the 2520. Even if our profession is different, it's it's how we act that matters. But to hold steadfastly to the principle of right as against might, right with the might within itself to win, that is the side of divinity. God will inspire his loyal and true children with his spirit. The Holy Spirit is the representative of God and will be the mighty working agent in our world to bind the loyal and true into bundles for the Lord's garner. Satan is also with intense activity, gathering together in bundles his tares from among the wheat. The teaching of every true ambassador for Christ is a most solemn, serious matter now. We are engaged in a warfare which will never close until the final decision is made for all eternity. Let every disciple of Jesus be reminded that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, there are eternal interests involved in this conflict, and there must be no surface work, no cheap experience to meet this issue. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, 
Bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So, so this verse here where it talks about these, these angels that are reserved, the angels themselves are not going to bring a railing accusation against them before the Lord. That's the Lord's work. Here's the principle you see, that we have no reproach, no railing accusation to bring against anybody or against any opposition anybody may make. We trust the truth which we preach. The power is in the thing, not in us. It is not only its own defense, but it is our defense too. And we do not have to defend it by condemning others. The Lord would have every human intelligence in his service withhold all severe accusations and railings. We are instructed to walk with wisdom toward them that are without. Leave with God the work of condemning and judging. It is all the same story. The truth itself is to be its own defense. The right itself is to be its own support and ours too. Christ invites us, come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Of course, that's one of my favorite verses, the, and Ellen White quotes that many times, learning in the school of Christ. But we see that um, this power of might against right, this taking up, this yoke, trusting in Christ, is contrary to the world. Everyone who heeds this invitation will yoke up with Christ. We are to manifest at all times and in all places the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Then the Lord will stand by his messengers and will make them his mouthpieces. And he who is mouthpiece for God will never put into the lips of human beings words which the majesty of heaven would not utter when contending with the devil. Our only safety is in receiving divine, in, divine inspiration from heaven. This alone can qualify men to be co-laborers with Christ. Now, we will study a little further along that line. In our study of the principle, the power of might as against right, we found in the previous lesson, had taken possession of this world by deceiving and bringing under his power the one into whose possession this world and the dominion of it had been put. So he studied, we studied last time, when you take the power of might against right, you actually come under Satan's dominion. You become part of his kingdom. Even though you may think you're opposing error and trying to put things right, you, you actually enter onto his territory, you become part of his dominion. Now the Lord, the God of heaven, did not propose to use any of the power of might, any kind of force to take that dominion out of Satan's hands, even though it be true that he unjustly held it. Now, think about that. Christ did not come, you know, to be this conquering Messiah. And why was that? Why, why didn't you, Christ just come at that time and, and conquer the kingdoms of this world? He had the power to do it. And he didn't do it. Why not? Because that would have been entering into Satan's dominion. He would have been using the methods. That's what Satan was tempting him to do, you know, in the wilderness, to do that very thing. Now, the thing is, Christ never does that, even at the end of the world, without something else first happening. That is, he first has to conquer Satan's kingdom on the principles of the power of right as against might. That is, Christ's character has to be reproduced in his people. He then can take those who are no longer under Satan's dominion, he can take them to heaven. But until they're no longer under Satan's dominion, can he bring them to heaven? If he did it by force, it wouldn't benefit those that he delivered. They would still be in Satan's dominion. So these people are unjustly held, right, 
in, to some extent, right? Everyone, Satan doesn't really have a right to this dominion. But Christ recognizes that he has this dominion because of the lie told at Eden, because of sin. And so in order to conquer Satan, he has to conquer sin. There would have been no injustice in taking it back, but that is not God's way of working. That is what we are studying. And so I think Jones here, it's true, it's not God's way of working, but it just wouldn't accomplish what God wants it to accomplish, what needs to be accomplished. <clears throat> I will say this here and can think upon it to all eternity. The universe of God rests upon the principle of self-sacrifice. The support, the stay of the very universe itself is the principle of self of sacrificing self to win. That is, to win by non-resistance, to win by the sheer principle of the power of right in itself. And that is what holds the universe up. In that it can in that it consists. And that is simply the gospel. It would be plain enough to say the gospel is that that holds up the universe. But the principle of the gospel is the principle of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and of God denying himself and giving himself to him. So, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but when I thought about this as a child, even before I was really converted, and I thought about um, politics, and one of the reasons I didn't have interest in politics is I didn't see that politics was going to solve the problem. My dad was very interested in politics. He he believed in, uh, you know, that politics was going to bring about God's kingdom on earth, right? So this, um, back in the 70s, whatever they called it, um, uh, liberation theology and all that kind of stuff, right? So he believed that, you know, we have to fight for these, for these, for the, liberation of people um but of course i realized that politics couldn't solve the problem because people needed to be converted even though i wasn't really converted at the time but i understood the idea and and so as a child i was a pacifist i didn't believe that you know that war was going to solve the problem you weren't going to bring about you know peace by having a war and of course, that was a little bit of the sentiment of the hippie culture as well. The problem is there's no power there without the cross of Christ. People can believe in non-resistance, um, but that's not enough. We have to understand the principles of the cross. We have to know Jesus Christ. We have to reflect his character. And so what ends up happening, non-resistance becomes violence quite quickly without Christ. Um, so, so the Lord in recovering this lost dominion would not use any might that is not right in itself. Therefore, when he wanted to recover this whole dominion and all of mankind, he went at it in such a way that Satan himself and all his partisans can never say that it was not fairly done. Now it was lost by man and it is regained by man. That is what we had in the second of Hebrews. When we began this study for unto the angels, hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels who cr thou crownedest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet for in that he put all in subjection under him he left nothing that is not put under him but now we do not yet all we do not we but now we see not yet all things put under him but we see jesus so this point here that uh we we don't see right now that god has been victorious that is, we don't see everything that God has promised worked out. We don't see that um, this world is, is in control because the dominion was lost to Satan. 
that it's not controlled by man, it's controlled by Satan. So we don't see any of these things, but we do see Jesus. And in Jesus, in seeing Jesus, in knowing Jesus, we can know these things by faith that God will accomplish what he promised, what his purpose for man was. We see Jesus in the place of the man and as the man. God has not put in subjection to the angels the world to come, whereof we speak, but he has put it in subjection to man. And Jesus Christ is that man. There is the second Adam. But so that I say, by man it was lost, and by man it is regained. By Adam it was lost, and by Adam it is regained. The Adam who regains it does so, not from the place at which the first Adam stood when he lost it, but from the place which the first Adam's descendants had reached in degeneracy under the influence and power of sin at the time when he entered upon the field to contest the right of Satan. So this battle is really won over, over ourselves because that's really where Satan seeks to have dominion. It's not so much the earth that he wants, but he wants God's crowning act of creation, man. So John says, I mean, when he entered upon the field in the open bodily contest, practically he entered upon the field before the universe was made. And since man sinned, he entered upon it also. But he had not taken flesh and entered upon the actual contest until he came into the world in human flesh. The Lord Jesus entered upon the open field in contest with Satan in human flesh at the point which human flesh had reached in degeneracy at the moment when he was born into the world. There, in the weakness of human nature, as it was in the world when he came into the flesh, he fought the battle. Human nature will never be any weaker. The world will never be any worse in itself. Human nature will never reach any lower condition in itself than it had reached when Jesus Christ came into the world. The only means by which human nature will be any worse is that the same stage of iniquity will be professing Christianity. Now, a man may be just nothing but wickedness, as the world was when Christ was born into the world. Yet if he makes no profession of Christianity, he does not make any profession of the principles of the gospel. God can reach that man in his lost condition by the gospel and save him through it. But let that man profess the gospel in his wickedness and use the profession of the gospel only as a form, as a cloak to cover his wickedness. And he takes out of the hand of God the only means the Lord has of saving man and perverts it to the support of his own iniquity. And that makes him worse in this respect and that he has cut himself off from salvation by taking God's means of salvation and making it a cloak for his iniquities and the support of his wickedness. In himself, in the flesh, his own practical fleshly wickedness is not any greater. Only now he is a hypocrite as well as wicked. The world in the last days will not be any worse in itself than it was when Christ was born into the world. The only way in which it will be worse, is that in having a form of godliness, but denying um, the power thereof, it uses the profession of Christianity to cover its ungodliness, and so perverts God's only means of salvation as to destroy itself against all remedy. Jesus Christ came into the world in that weakest stage of human flesh, and in that flesh, as a man, he fought the battle with Satan. But Satan himself can never find any fault with the way of salvation as being in any sense unfair. Satan deceived and overcame man as the man stood in the glory and image of God with all the blessing and the power and the goodness of God on his side. Now, when this second Adam comes into human flesh, right at the point to which Satan had brought the whole race by sin, and there in all this weakness enters upon the contest, Satan can never say that that is not fair. He can never say, you have taken an unfair advantage. You have come here with too strong a panoply, a panoply about you, uh, with too many safeguards for it, it to be a fair contest. He cannot do it. 
For there stood Christ in the very weakness of the flesh to which Satan himself had brought man. Christ came in the very weakness which Satan had brought upon the race. And in that weakness says, here we are for the conflict. My brother won it. He won it. Thank the Lord and glory to his name. Now, another view or another phase of the same view. You remember in the week of prayer readings, one of them was on the subject of loyalty to God. And the passage in Job was considered relative to the sons of men, which came before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. The thought was presented that these sons of God were those from the other worlds, the different parts of the universe, corresponding to what Adam was as he stood at the head of this world when the world was made and put under his power and given him as his dominion. The scripture says Adam was the son of God. Now, when Satan came into the world and took dominion by taking under his power the head of the, his, this dominion, he then stood in the place in this world where Adam should have stood. Therefore, when the sons of God from the other worlds came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them and presented himself before the Lord. As the representative of this world, which is under his dominion, I simply present this to call your attention to the thought for further study. So I think we're familiar with that idea. Um, anyway, he goes on. Now, from Satan's dominion here, ever since he obtained it, God has been calling from this world people to himself. Ever since the day that Satan obtained control of this world and God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. God has been calling people from the ranks of Satan unto himself and into his dominion. And many had been coming all the time, but all this time Satan had been making the charge that that was not fair. He was arguing, these are my rightful conquest and you are leading them off to you. What have you done? What have you done that by right? You can't, you can do that when I gained it here. Thus, he was always contesting the right of God to do this and was also accusing all those whom God called out of this world unto himself. He was accusing them before God day and night. He declared, these are my property. They are my rightful subjects. They are laden with sin and are altogether wicked. Yet you call them out and justify them and hold them before the universe and propose to hold them up before the universe as though they had been good all the time. That is not fair. They are sinners. They are wicked. They are just like the rest of us over here. Thus, he is the accuser of the brethren, accusing before God day and night everyone who had turned from his authority unto God's. And you can see this, this principle of the great controversy, that in order for those that have died, to be secure in heaven, there has to be a work that is accomplished that answers Satan's accusations. And we know that Christ came and he's done that for those that believe. But there still is ultimately this answer to Satan's accusations against God. Now, Jesus came into the world to demonstrate that he had the right to do all this and that it was fair. And he came at the point of weakness, which we considered a while ago, and entered upon the contest with Satan to recover by right the headship of this lost dominion. Now notice, Satan had gained, not by right, but by might as against right, the headship of the dominion from the first Adam to whom it was rightfully given. Now, if we think about this, how is it um, by might? Well, one is he used deceit, right? That is part of might. He didn't use an army to come. So he didn't use might in that way, but he used might through manipulation. The second Adam comes not by might as against right, but by right against might and regains the headship of this world and all the dominion of it. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, he was raised up to the headship of all principality and power and might and dominion, not only of this world, but also of that which is to come. Now, turn to the 12th chapter of Revelation. There's a passage from which, from which is derived all this that I've been saying. When Christ was born into the world, the visions 
Vision opens and there stood Satan ready to devour Christ as soon as he should be born. The seventh verse, there was war in heaven. Michael's, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Now the word accuser there signifies in the Greek, he who accuses another in a court. And that would correspond in our country to a prosecutor. The German translation uh, gives the same idea exactly. Our word accuser does not give it so clearly because one man may accuse another falsely and tell lies about him and backbite as thousands of people do. And that is following the same principle of Satan, of course. But that is not the thought here. Here, this accuser is one who comes as a prosecuting attorney into a court. You see the situation. Here was Satan who had this dominion and God was calling and receiving those who would turn to him from the power of Satan. But Satan claimed the right to all these subjects. Um, all these subjects. Anyway, now he would enter into the court of God, and there, as a prosecuting attorney, he would prosecute all these his subjects as slaveholders used to do under the fugitive state law in the United States. He would prosecute all these in that court and demand that they should be given up once more to his authority. And that it was not injustice or out of right that they should be thus taken away. And two, there was room for him to present that argument with an apparent shadow of right to it, because the contest had not yet been carried on. The battle had not been fought and uh, the victory won so completely that his argument and his right as a prosecuting attorney should be annihilated. Now, it is true that the promise was certain and the victory was certain and the promise of God secure, but still it was yet to be tested in an open conflict in the flesh, so that when Christ came into the flesh, there was just as much temptation upon him through the power of Satan, as though there never had been any promise of redemption. Or shall we say that much? Shall we say that when Christ did come in the flesh, there was as much temptation for him to meet, and it was as real as temptation as though no promise had ever been made of redemption? Assuredly. If not, then he was guarded against temptation, and the conflict was not real, but more imaginary than real. He came into the world to demonstrate the unrighteousness of the argument that Satan was presenting in the courts of God as the prosecuting attorney from this country. That is the thought. It is legal all the way through. Jesus came here into Satan's territory and took human nature at the point to which Satan himself had brought it. In this human nature, he met Satan on his own ground and against all his own power defeated him merely by the power of trusting in right itself as against might. Um, he exercised no shadow of might, it should say there. It says right, but that's why they put that uh, citation there. So himself to do anything of himself to protect or help himself. So he exercised no shadow of might himself to do anything of himself, to protect or help himself. He trusted completely and fully in that divine power of right as against might and all that it can bring. And he conquered and thus became by right the head of this dominion again and of all who will be redeemed from it and of the redemption of the dominion itself. <clears throat> And now that word also in the Greek, which says that the accuser of our brethren is cast down, conveys the idea of a prosecuting attorney who comes into court, but he has no case anymore, he is repudiated, he has no place for argument. Why? Because now we have an advocate in the court, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Thank the Lord. In the court before Jesus Christ, in the court before Jesus Christ came in the flesh, there was an accuser of the brethren, a prosecuting attorney, pleading his legal rights to the subjects of his dominion as they were leaving his dominion and going over to the other. 
he could present that argument with the appearance of a shadow of right because his dominion, his authority had not yet been positively contested. <clears throat> but Christ came and did contest it righteously and fairly at every step of the way. And so fairly that Satan himself cannot bring any charge of unfairness against it. And having won it, now Christ takes the place in court, not as a prosecuting attorney, but as an advocate. And when he comes into the court as advocate by right, the other one, the accuser, the prosecuting attorney is repudiated, he is shut out. He has no case at all against those whom he would accuse. That is good, that is good. Now, I wanna point out something here. We know that Satan was cast down when? Because Jones has, has quoted Revelation 12, and he's talked about Christ being victorious over the accuser of our brethren. Um, so when is that, that Satan is cast down and his angels are cast down with him? Right, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. When is this speaking of? Is this talking about at the beginning of the of the world? Or is this talking about at the time of the cross? Or is this talking at, s at some other point in history? Anybody with thoughts on that? You may not want to answer that question, but we can say that Satan was cast out at the beginning and he was cast down to the earth. We can also say that this occurred at the cross. Does this war continue? Yeah, the war is still going on, but Satan has lost it. I mean, he knows he's he's lost it. He just persists in doing evil and trying to get us to join with him. Yeah, so we can say that Satan was cast down and his angels were cast down with him when there was rebellion and war in heaven before the creation of the world, right? We can also say that at the cross, this occurred. Ellen White makes this clear, actually, if you read through her writings. That at the cross, that there is a battle that is won. There's a change that happens in heaven. But we know that this, this earth still continues on. Now, Christ begins his work as our high priest in heaven. But that work has to be completed. And this is one of the, the basic principles of Adventism, understanding the issues of the great controversy and the role of Christ in this great controversy as our advocate. So Christ demonstrated something, but the issues are not over yet because we need to see Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. So what Christ did will answer the question to those who have faith, that is we can trust based upon what Christ has done, that we can overcome as he overcame, that in Christ we can be victorious over sin. But what we we still what still has to occur is that final demonstration so that Christ can close up this earth's history. That hasn't been done. He needs his character, his work that he accomplished at the cross needs to be worked out throughout humanity. He needs to reclaim those who are 
uh, were in Satan's dominion, bring them into Christ's dominion and have them live a perfect life of righteousness without a mediator to demonstrate that God can judge the hearts of those that he declares righteous as righteous and those he declares wicked as wicked. Because not everyone is going to have that opportunity to live out that life of righteousness. So the thief on the cross says to Christ, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He exercises faith, but he's going to be there. Christ can judge that. He says, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. He promised it to that thief on the cross. But you can see that Satan can come and say, well, how can you take that thief on the cross? He never had an opportunity uh, to prove that he followed you. But Christ can judge the heart. Satan can't. So there are going to be many people in heaven who Christ has declared as righteous, that he's going to know that heaven is secure. And many who believe that we would believe are righteous that are not going to be there. And Christ is going to uh, give the 144,000 a thousand years to examine these books and check these check that everything was done correctly. So much so that at the end of the thousand years, all of the wicked who have been declared wicked will acknowledge that the judgment against them is just. To be in a courtroom where the requirement is not just that a jury condemns uh, the criminal, but that the criminal ex himself accepts the judgment. If any criminal was to uh, not accept the judgment, God's work wouldn't have been accomplished. Because even Satan himself will acknowledge that God's judgment is just. And that is the power of the gospel. <clears throat> so um, let's go on here. Hopefully that's clear. These things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin. There may be an accuser, the accuser still. He may enter his plea as a prosecuting attorney. But now we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And by his standing in court, that prosecuting attorney is repudiated, put out and cast down. That is the story. And I'm glad of it. That is the value of our advocate in the court. He shuts out the prosecuting attorney and takes away his case so that he has no place in court at all. Thank the Lord. Now we come to another point. It is the answer to a query that has risen in the minds of some upon the point that was made the other night, that the Lord Jesus in heaven will never be in all respects as he was before. The query is this. There stands the scripture. We read it that we read it that night. We took the text upon that. Father, glorify thou me with thine own self the glory which I had with thee before the world was, that will be done. That glory which he had before the world was, is his now and will be his to all eternity. And so you look in the bulletin page 331, 332, and you'll see the testimony which I read upon the humiliation of Christ. He was born in the form of God. He who was born in the form of God took the form of man in the flesh he was all the while as God, but he did not appear as God. He divested himself of the form of God and in its stead took the form and fashion of man. The glories of the form of God, he for a while relinquished. Note the difference. The glories of the form of God, he for a while relinquished. But the form of God itself, he is to all eternity relinquished. Um, that is the contrast that is in the scriptures and in the contrast that is here. Being in the form of God, he took the form of man. Then on page 382 of the bulletin, we read again from the testimony this word, bearing our human form before the Father's throne and through eternal ages. Do you see the difference is not in the glory? It is in the form 
upon which the glory rests and through which it is manifested and through which it is reflected. Now, there's something else in that that comes right along with the thought. He was in the form of God. He left that. He emptied himself. And the French version is translated, he annihilated himself. And it is none too strong for as to the form which he bore, he annihilated himself. And in that form, he will never again appear. Our human form, he bears before the Father's throne and through eternal ages. And the glory of the form of God, which he had when he was in the form of God, that glory he brings to our human form. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given thee. He has given the glory of God everlastingly to us, to the human form, to human flesh. Instead of Christ being lowered, we are exalted. Instead of divinities being lowered or lessened, humanity is exalted and glorified. Instead of bringing him down to all eternity to where we are, it lifts us to all eternity to where he is. Instead of robbing him of his glory and putting him where we are, who have none, he laid aside this glory for a season and became ourselves and took our form forever in order that he in this form and we in him shall be exalted to the glory which he had before the world was. Now, there's a little more in that yet. In what form was the contest carried on with Satan? In our human form, in my form, in my nature, in your nature. For how much of God's universe was that contest carried on? How much was involved in it? The whole of it. Then in this world and in our flesh and form, there was carried on the contest. There was fought the battle and there was gained the victory that involves the whole universe. In this contest, the whole universe was involved, and one way or the other, whichever way it should have turned. Therefore, to carry out God's eternal purpose, he had to come into this world and to take our form and nature, because in this world and in our form and nature is where the, that purpose was contested and where it all centered. He who was one with God emptied himself and took our form and nature and fought the battle in this form and nature. And the battle was won in this form and nature. To what form and nature belongs the victory? To our form and nature belongs the victory. In the nature of things, it is to our form and nature in Jesus Christ and joined with Jesus Christ that the victory belongs. So you see that this contest, this victory, not only carries us in the universe to where Adam was, nor only to where he would have been, but to where Jesus Christ, by divine right, is. Oh, it is wonderful. That is so. And the best of all is that it is true. <clears throat> we often lose sight of the glory of this in looking only at the misfortune of the entrance of sin. It was a misfortune. It is true that sin should enter the universe at all. And in that sense, it was a misfortune that sin struck this world so that the battle had to be fought in this world for the universe. But having struck this world and involved this world, it involved you and me so that here in our nature had to be fought the contest for the universe. We can thank God that the victory is won and that we have a share in this victory for the universe. Therefore, it is not altogether a misfortune, you see, because God is able to turn our greatest misfortunes into the grandest victories. It would have been the greatest misfortune for us if there were no redemption. But when God puts his hand to a thing, he turns our greatest misfortunes into the grandest victories. And this greatest misfortune to the universe, God turns to the grandest victory for the universe. Oh, he makes it turn to the absolute and eternal triumph of the universe. Christ did empty himself of the form of God and take our human form. He did empty himself of the nature of God and take our human nature. And in so doing, he brought divinity to humanity. In so doing, he caused humanity to conquer Satan um, <clears throat> and sin against all Satan's power. Christ won the victory in our human nature. And therefore, he says not only 
Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before, had with thee before the world was. But he says further, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Instead of bringing him to all eternity, to where we were, it takes us to all eternity where he is. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We have an advocate in the heavenly court who, by every conceivable right, stands there as our advocate and shuts out the prosecuting attorney that would accuse us before God day and night. He wins our case, our cases, because he has won them. And now being in the form of God, he emptied himself and took the form of a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and he has exalted us in him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, I just want to point out something here. Now, when we think about this glory of Christ, this glory is in his humili humility. This glory is in his self-sacrifice. Self this glory that he had, it's not like Christ, you know, was this glorious, worshipful being who gave up temporarily <clears throat> a place of position and power and then became humble as a man and then goes back again to that position of power in the sense that he always had that humility. His glory that he always had was his character, the character of Christ. So when somebody thinks about heaven in the sense of, you know, streets of gold and, and all of these wonderful things that we get all of our wishes and desires, um, and doesn't understand that heaven is a place of self-sacrifice, that, that the principle of God's government is this principle that has to be uh, demonstrated in humanity, that where we don't trust self, that others, we consider others better than ourselves, others' needs before our own. So, so in some sense, you know, that glory came with him, maybe not in the same, same way, it wasn't visible, but it was his character. So he, he never, you know, he doesn't have a different character as a man. The humility that he showed is his character. We delight to bow our knees to him now. In that day, we shall rejoice to do it also in his glory. But whether one does it now or not, in that day when Jesus Christ is crowned with his triumphal crown before the universe and for the universe, then every knee from Lucifer unto the last man that has rejected him, will also bow and will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they will do it to the glory of God the Father. And in that day, every tongue in the universe will confess the divinity of the truth and the everlasting righteousness of the principle of right as against might. <clears throat> So a very powerful message, this, this idea of, of right, of trusting that God will accomplish things in spite of what we see. <clears throat> okay, well, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord this message from A.T. Jones that speaks to us now. And we live in this world of sin and suffering, and we see so much around us that we would like to change. But we know also, Lord, we have the ability to see the things in our own lives and to yield those things to Christ. We may not be able to see all that you are doing in our lives, but we can look to Christ and see what he has done. And that we can trust that he can do those things in us in spite of ourselves. We know, Lord, that there is a work to be done. 
in our lives so that there can be a work done in this world in bringing others from Satan's dominion into your precious kingdom. And so we give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you can use us, that you can bless this Sabbath and the time that we have together. Be with us um, throughout this Sabbath in uh, bringing unity with Christ and with one another. I pray for each person that you can watch over them, that your angels can care for them. Again, we pray uh, for Dwight, his mom, and uh, his family. We just ask, Lord, that uh, you can help them in their trials. Draw all men unto you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>